Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, we'll give a few minutes there to let everyone in, but we will get started now. So, yes, yeah, so good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. It's awesome to see so many people tune in to our webinar today. Um, unfortunately, our CEO, uh, Rosalind, is unable to join us today due to family bereavement. Um, he sends his apologies, but in place we do have Martin Robinson, who is our UK and Ireland country manager. Today is a very important day on the Recite Me calendar. Um, it's Global Accessibility Awareness Day. So I'm looking forward to celebrating uh, this day, bringing everyone together so we can talk and learn about digital accessibility. We have a panel of amazing guest speakers with some really important points to discuss. Um, but before we go any further, I have to just go over a few uh, old webinar housekeeping points. Um, everyone is muted, as you can see. And um, this is so obviously no background noise can interrupt us. Um, if you would like to, uh, to enable live captioning, please use the live transcript button at the bottom of your Zoom screen and then click show subtitles. Um, it'd be great to get everyone involved. So any questions, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. We can then collect all these questions together and then we can uh, ask the panel of them at the end. If anyone has any technical problems or trouble hearing, please drop um, us a message and we will do our best to help you with that. The webinar is being recorded um, and it will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. So if you want to come and watch us again or some of the signups missed it, it is available um, after the webinar. Um, today's session will be interactive using our polls. So please get involved um, and I hope you enjoy this webinar. I will start off a round of introductions, um, and so I will hand over to Martin. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Um, excuse me. So, um, as Michael said, um, I'm a I'm a last minute replacement. So, apologies. You're not getting Ross and all of his hair, um, but he he has uh, he has suffered a, a family bereavement uh, this week. So, unfortunately, he, he couldn't make make it. Um, I've been with Recite and working with Ross for just over six years now um so there's not much about recite i don't know or not much i shouldn't know um we'll come on to that a bit later i guess we'll, we'll talk about how recite came to be um and, and and a bit about um ross's background so you don't want to hear about me it, it, ross is the story when it comes to recite so that's what that's what we'll do um and and my remit here is um uh, is all things uk commercial really um but primarily that means um looking after our, uh, our our fabulous sales teams um so yeah that's me um i'll i'll be back um and meanwhile i'll let uh, let sean lynn and mike introduce themselves as well i'll go first um hi everybody it's lovely to see you virtually and um, my name is lynn gilmore i'm a communications officer at children in scotland as the name suggests we're based in scotland we're a national policy organization and charity we work directly with children and young people and families and the children's sector workforce and our overall aim is to give every child in scotland an equal chance to flourish hi i'm mike adams and i'm chief exec of purple and we're a UK-based organisation who is trying to change the disability conversation. And today I'm going to look at that issue through the lens of a disabled customer. Hi, I'm Sean. I'm Head of Talent Acquisition at the Very Group, an e-commerce retailer and FS provider. I'm a recruiter by trade of 14 years, predominantly in tech. So i um, seen lots of... Um, uh, lots of topics around accessibility and inclusiveness, as you can imagine, uh, when you, you look at stuff like tech recruitment and recruitment as a whole. So that's me. Awesome stuff. Thank you. Um, so um, if I give a bit of background on just what Global Accessibility Awareness Day is and accessibility in particular, hopefully that'll set us up for what's to come and what we're going to hear from, from the speakers. Um, so. For those who aren't aware, today is the 11th Global Accessibility Awareness Day. Um, and the purpose is to get people talking and thinking about digital access and inclusion um, and how you, we collectively, can help the over 1 billion people in the world with disabilities 
access online information more easily. Um, and so what do I actually mean when I talk about digital accessibility? Well, I, I tend to go back a step and talk about what, it, what is the definition of accessibility? Well, for me, accessibility is being easily understood. Um, and so what you're looking for is removal of barriers. Um, and so if you apply that to digital spaces, so websites and, and, and other um, platforms, um, then really what you what what we're going to be talking about, or I am anyway, is is looking at um, what are the things that are in the way when people with disabilities are trying to consume online content, and what can we do to mitigate those things? Um, so we'll learn about how easy it is to access stuff. We'll talk about how um, how we can help. Um, but firstly, um, Michael's going to run through some. Um, interesting and in some cases astounding stats and, and figures for us yeah well, i hope everyone can see my screen okay so yes yeah, so we'll start off with some overall facts so as martin was saying that yes we know that one over one billion people with different forms of disabilities encounter barriers online but the audience doesn't stop there we have visual impairments we have learning difficulties we have people who don't speak english the first language or people who just want that extra support, maybe a ruler, just to view and absorb content online much easier. So the amount of people and the different types and diverse range of people that are trying to help is vast. And when we look at online accessibility, we can see that some of the facts around people of adults who feel like they're excluded because of their conditions, maybe 59, 49%. We also have people that face barriers online, that's 50% of disabilities over non-disability people. And when we think of businesses, we think of employees and recruitment. And once again, some statistics there. And I think, you know, having to apply for 60% more jobs to find your next role just because you've got a disability isn't right. And then we look at people who find the actual impact on their job search at an alarming 75%. These are things that us as businesses can help with and then once people do get into the workplace that's where this you know their talents flourish and where businesses see benefits around revenue uh, revenue increases and profit margins and just better ideas and decision making from a diverse range of companies and i'm sure when we talk about when mike comes to talk about the purple pound and how businesses can help consumers online is a great business opportunity as well for people so some statistics there to set a foundation ready for the discussions ahead thanks michael um i realized we uh, we, we moved through those slides so quite quickly um <laughs> they'll be available afterwards um obviously as part of the webinar recording but i think we michael will probably send out emails as well will you michael Yes, that's true. I will be sending everything out to everyone. Awesome stuff. But loads of stuff in there to think about. Um, as, as Michael said, some um, some topics and, and, and some themes that we'll come back to, undoubtedly. Um, but I wanted to get us thinking about the, the importance of digital accessibility by asking a question. So we'll do that in the form of a poll. So anyone who's on the uh, on the call be able to vote um, and what we're asking is globally how many people do you think encounter barriers when trying to complete everyday tasks online and the options are one in 100 one in 25 one in 10 or one in five and we'll give everyone a couple of minutes to um, to get an answer registered um, but as michael mentioned you know it's important to remember that not all disabilities are visible um, just because you can't see um, a disability or a, uh, or an impairment doesn't mean it's not there. Um, we'll give that another. How long do we need to give another thirty seconds? Yeah, another another few seconds should should do it. Okay, so we've got 4% think 1 in 100, 21% think 1 in 25, 1 in 10, 40% think that, and 
36% think it's one in five. Well, the answer is one in five. So one in five, um, excuse me, people potentially need help, need, need, need some sort of assistive tech to access online content. Um, well done to 36% of you. <laughs> Um, what about how much value there is in online spending? Um, and I know Mike is, is going gonna, is gonna to touch on this topic, but how much do you think businesses lose per month by ignoring the needs of disabled people? And your options here are 10 million, 500 million, 1 billion or 2 billion. And again, we'll give that a little bit of time. Um, oh, excuse me. So again, that's how much businesses how much do businesses lose per month by ignoring the needs of disabled people? 10 million, 500 million, 1 billion or 2 billion. We'll give that another few seconds. Okay, so the majority, 44% think 1 billion, 26% um, think 500 million, 12% think 10 million, and 18% think 2 billion. Um, well, this is a, a figure that came from Purple. Um, so Mike will tell us it's it's actually 2 billion um, and I'm, I'm not gonna steal any of his thunder, but I'm sure that it's gonna form a big part of what he's about to tell you next. So um, yeah, thank you for your answers on that. Thank you, Martin, for that. Yeah, so now let's start off by hearing more about the businesses and what they miss out by closing themselves off uh, from the disability market. Uh, and we can hear from uh, Mike Adams, OBE, and the CEO of Purple. Thank you very much, everyone, and it's great to, to be here. And, and those figures are absolutely astounding, but real. And, and, and this morning in real time, I was following a LinkedIn conversation uh, about the purple pound in the UK, which stands at 274 billion pounds per annum and rising at 14% per annum. And globally, the, the, it, it's $8 trillion, um, of which, by the way, only 10% of businesses have any kind of strategy to access this disability market and, and the solutions to accessing this market are really pretty straightforward. And for most of you as businesses, particularly if you're in the B2C world, your raison d'etre is around good customer experience. And, and what we are saying, and my call to action to businesses is start to see individuals first and foremost as consumers who happen to have a disability. And the ripple effects are enormous because it's not just that disabled individual, the impact on the family as well. And just think if you've got an auntie, a grandma, a cousin, and you work in a business and that individual has an experience which is less than anyone else, purely and simply because they happen to have a disability. Um, that cannot be right, and that isn't right. And therefore, it's the organisations and individuals within organisations that have to put it right. And just one more statistic that I'll throw at you is I did a face-to-face -face conference all about eight months ago, and they did a poll and the question I asked was how many people in this room, there was 305, um, knew someone who 
had a disability either as a relative or someone in their close network and and and, and by disability i'm talking about people who have physical and sensory impairments mental health uh, neurodiversity living with cancer etc and the answer in that room that day was 92 percent the, the the last time there was a kind of empirical research was about five years ago and the figure was 50 percent and and this is why this issue um is 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 resonates with all of us because the vast majority the vast majority will know someone with a disability and it's really interesting i think martin said this is the 11th gad um, well, up to three years ago, I'd never heard of it. And, and, and then COVID and then lockdown and overnight probably was the biggest social change. And what it did was shine a real light on just how inaccessible the online world is and was. And, you know, when you, when you realise that only 3% of the top 1 million websites across the globe meet basic accessibility standards you know how huge the climb is but you also know how big the opportunity for businesses who get it right is and and what we know for evidence from disabled people in covid is they were dis disproportionately isolated because they weren't able to access information they weren't able to book online shopping slots and just simply buying and purchasing goods couldn't happen and so the challenge really today globally is we have to redefine what we mean by accessibility and and we have to ensure that we do not create new barriers or the ones that are starting to emerge we dismantle because we can and that really is the online uh barriers and and very much when I was growing up, accessibility was about wheelchairs, it was about lifts, it was about ramps. And, and that is incredibly important. And everyone will remember COP26 in Glasgow last November, when the Israeli minister, who happened to be a wheelchair user, couldn't get in the building because there was no wheelchair access. But increasingly, it is how do you make sure you provide accessibility to your online digital assets and that could be decluttering web pages for people with mental health being able to stop the pop-ups for example it's about where you navigate people through colors make sure there are words there as well so the three million people with color blindness don't get totally lost and fundamentally it is about putting and ensuring a site map so for people who don't use mouse, for example, can navigate their way through keystrokes. And I think just for you, I think what we just need to bear in mind is think of individuals as customers who happen to have a disability. And some easy wins is within your organisation, talk about the issue. And I think in the last two years, three years, I spend 85% of my time talking about mental health because it's a huge issue for all organizations around performance and, and well being, uh, neurodiversity, and online accessibility. Because increasingly, we are moving to a world where that will be the gateway to people either engaging with your business or being introduced to your business. And if that gate is shut, they simply won't come in. Um, and I'm delighted to be working with Recite Me um, to continue the support of Purple Tuesday, which is about how do businesses improve the disabled customer experience. So we want to give you the solutions to this $8 trillion market by making you more accessible and getting you to commit to making changes to your practice so you can have a better relationship with your customers. And I can see from the chat box how many people from the United States are on the call today, for example. Well, you'll be delighted to know um, that on the 1st of November this year, we'll celebrate 
Purple Tuesday, which is a, about 365 days, not just one day a year, with an event in London, with an event in Minneapolis, with an event in Dubai, and an event in Malaysia. And this is because the issues that we're talking about, disabled consumers, is an absolute global issue. And I'm going to leave it there because I can see I've gone beyond the six minutes, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions that might come up during the course of the rest of the webinar. Thank you, Mike. Much appreciated. Some fantastic insights and facts and, you know, something that we can all take away with um, how we can improve our business and the, the outset of that. Um, but businesses, we need to think past consumers also. Uh, and it's very important to look at our employees in the workplace. Um, Sean, uh, please, can you share some experiences uh, with yourself and the, the very group? Yeah, of course. I think... Um... You've all touched on so many important points, right? So I, th I think the most important one for me when we talk about inclusion and accessibility is we're, we're all human. So why would we not want to treat each other like humans? And, and from a recruitment angle, we need to be looking at our processes to make sure they're fit for purpose for, for anybody to, you know, physical, non-physical um, disabilities to be able to, to come through and, and, you know, get the same uh, experience and the same opportunities as anybody else. Um, you talk around diverse uh, teams that that ultimately you know diversity of thought uh, people from different backgrounds experiences can provide better solutions especially when as Mike was talking about it business uh, b2c you know you can actually relate to your um, to your consumers and, and your customers and, and actually uh, uh, replicate them so I've, I've only been at um, the very group for 11 months so fairly uh, fairly new in but I've been doing recruitment predominantly tech recruitment for 14 years. And I think one, one thing that I've seen um, changing a lot more uh, recently is actually just asking questions. And again, Mike has touched on so many points, which has uh, led in perfectly for me. Um, but I don't think I've seen one company that's got a perfect process, right? To, to you know, there's, you always need to adapt and you always need to ask questions. So the first thing, you know, I've, I've done since joining here is we've taken a step back to look at, right, what's our current what's our current practices and processes and that's straight from your your advertising and marketing of of the vacancies that you're looking to recruit into your business right through to to that full uh, journey of that candidate if they're successful and, and and join the business and what that looks like so there's no point having this amazing recruitment process if you don't have the environment there for them to come into and, and be fully supported and uh, be able to be them so for me we, we've sort of taken that step back one of the things we've done and, and plug recite me again here is we've brought, <laughs> brought recite me in um on our uh, career site which is has been super helpful and a, a really good starting point for us to to um uh, to get a lot of education from yourselves as, as well in, in terms of how we can change things and, and removing that one size fits all um approach when it comes to uh, interviewing uh, for roles and, and the way that candidates apply um you know you need to have that flexibility where you know, we can give the right information to every candidate through whichever sort of way we do a process, but at the same time, they're able to bring their best self uh, to that interview. And I think one thing that COVID has taught us is you don't need to do everything on site anymore. Um, so you can actually become, I think companies are becoming more flexible with how they approach things and how they do things. So if you think about mobility issues for some people, getting halfway up the country to go to an interview could have been um, really difficult, but being able to do stuff remotely um, and, and just change the way um, that you do things. So we've been doing a lot of sort of self-assessment really, and we're, we're still on that journey. And I don't think that journey ever ends. Um, I think that the, the final thing we've been doing is, is really trying to understand from candidates, both successful and unsuccessful candidates, you know, what that process has felt like and, and looked like for them uh, to see where we can improve. And then using networks across the business um, as well to understand how how we can sort of make things more inclusive and accessible so we've got some great uh, great internal networks women at very race at very lgbtq plus uh, etc so we're actually reaching out um, to, to engage with those networks and ask questions and learn and understand because um, that's uh, yeah i'm rabbiting on anyway so i don't know if you want to ask any questions or that i'll just dribble off uh, for quite a while but yeah so we've been been doing quite trying to do quite a lot and, and still a lot to go I think. Awesome. 
Thank you, Sean. I'm sure people have some questions about uh, inclusive recruitment, which we can we can bag up and save save for the end. So yeah, so we have spoken about how being accessible online and removing barriers barriers sorry is a no brainer to improve business and supporting people within the workplace. But what about end users as well around about children? So uh, Lynn, please can you share with us your experience of with children in Scotland and young people online? Yeah, of course. Um, it's lovely to be here and it's been really interesting listening to Mike and Sean. I think hopefully a lot of what I say will be similar. So yes, I'm going to talk hopefully briefly. I can talk for days and I talk very quickly. So um, we're going to look at what, why it's important for charities to remove digital barriers and for us at Children in Scotland, particularly the impact of what an inaccessible website looks like for children and young people. Very briefly, my background, my personal experience of accessibility is that growing up, it wasn't really a thing as Mike touched on. Um, I'm incredibly short-sighted and so at school I had the option to sit at the back of the class with my friends and not see the blackboard. It was all handwritten blackboards in those days or handwritten projector slides or I had the choice of being moved to the front of the classroom and sitting with the naughty children who were also moved there and so even at that age I had to put my hand up and, and acknowledge that there was a difference and that I had a difference and that's not really how it should be. And so the chance to work within accessibility now, and particularly with children and young people, to hopefully avoid that experience for them is, is a real privilege. So at Children in Scotland, as I said, our aim is that every child in Scotland has a chance to flourish equally. So we work with professionals, practitioners across health, education, um, all across the third sector in Scotland, and we work with children, young people and families. So potentially our audience then is everybody who either works with, knows or has children. So we know that that's a big responsibility and we know that there's a lot of trust placed in us. And we have an obligation to provide information and provide it in an accessible way. And the fundamentals of our approach to accessibility, we hope are fairly simple. We can everybody or as many people as possible access our information equally and in a way that works for them. And if the answer is yes, then we carry on with that journey. And if the answer is no, then we need to reassess what we're doing. Briefly, our content for adults, we run training events for the sector. These can be for parents or workforce, teachers, etc. They obviously moved online during the pandemic from in person. And so we had to have a really quick adjustment to match digital accessibility needs, captioning, transcripts. That was a huge learning curve, I'll be honest. And we acknowledge that there's always lessons to be learned and we had to acknowledge where we could do better at some point. And I think for all of us, the pandemic caused such a, an instant shutdown that that in particular, that strand of our work had to change really quickly. We also deliver research and policy based projects. And so in terms of accessibility, these include surveys and policy documents and reports. We work with the government quite a lot. So you can imagine some of the, the language used is pretty dense, some of the terminology, a lot of acronyms. And this kind of language can also be a barrier to accessibility. We also work with a range of partners, groups from ethnically diverse backgrounds, LGBT, young people with care experience, communities in areas of deprivation. And we all talk and have been talking this afternoon about accessibility as relating to people with disabilities, but also there's so many other audiences that can benefit from content that's available, perhaps different formats, different colour contrasts, and obviously with Recite.me, the translation functionality is a really important part. So keeping accessibility in mind means that we try to write clearly. Plain English is always better than using 10 words when you can use three. Uh, avoid unnecessary jargon. These things all seem simple, but when you assess what you're doing and how you're writing, sometimes you realise you're not writing as clearly as you could be. Using Recite Me for us on our website also means that content can be absolutely personalised to audiences. And this then breaks down barriers. Users can listen to the content, they can change font size, they can translate it. And that means that everybody should hopefully feel included and heard. Where we produce video or audio content like podcasts, these are also captioned and have transcripts. And we also additionally have a brand font at Children's Scotland and a colour palette that we've chosen to be accessible, thinking about colour contrast and ratios of colour. We're really lucky to have a designer who is constantly learning about colour contrast and accessible design. And I think just very briefly, it's worth saying that sometimes there can be a tension between what we consider sleek design and accessibility. So thinking of like funky fonts, I don't know if anyone uses the word funky anymore, but fonts that are eye catching and really colours that pop and neon colours. But for so many people with visual impairment, 
and visual issues, colours pop in an extremely bad way. You can't see the text, there's colour flare. So we always put accessibility first ahead of what you might consider to be eye-catching design elements. And it is possible to do both and also feel free and confident to say no to particular colour choices or fonts if you come across them in your work and they're not accessible. Our work with children then, um, a lot of our policy work involves direct work with children and young people. They have absolutely the same needs as professionals and adults. They want clean information and they want it to be available in a range of formats. And young people are absolutely the best at giving honest feedback. So when something doesn't work, they will absolutely let you know. In some situations, a lack of accessible information can be a huge barrier um, in our work. So we manage three other services. We manage a in service called Inquire, another called Reach, and another called My Rights, My Say. We have in Scotland additional support for learning legislation. And I think in other countries that's perhaps called special needs or additional support needs. So here it's additional support for learning. These three services work directly with children and young people with additional support needs. Um, and they need to be able to access information easily that relates to school, to exams, to bullying, and also with their rights in education. And additional support for learning is enshrined in legislation here in Scotland, so they have specific rights. With Acquire and Reach, it was particularly apparent during the initial lockdown. Um, young people were obviously not in school, but they were still dealing with issues surrounding additional support provision, which might be learning assistance or extra time for exams, and also crucially making the transition to high school, which happened you know, a few months after the lockdown in 2020. We also all are aware that information is being issued every day from government um, about changes to rules and restrictions, and it was a very scary time. So it's important as a trusted resource that Inquire and Children in Scotland were able to continue to share information that could be accessed by children and young people in the way that worked for them. And also that parents had somewhere that they could find information that they needed. Particularly, we work with communities with English as an additional language, and we know that they were more excluded during the pandemic. And so to have website content and resources available in so many languages via Restraint Toolbar, that was really a lifeline for those families. I would say also social media, consider that as a big part of your digital accessibility work. So again, principles of writing clearly, um, use alt text for images, have clearly defined links. So click here to view the thing, to download the thing and just streamline and simplify. I have no idea if I've gone over time. I probably have, but my clock is too small to see. I would just say summing up, accessibility can seem probably quite daunting if you're beginning that journey. Um, but you're absolutely not alone with it. As you've seen at this webinar, there are hundreds of other people on this journey to you that can offer support and advice. We at Children in Scotland are always reviewing our practice, seeing if we can do things better or differently. We look at the statistics and we can see on the website how people are accessing Recite Me. So we can see if they're listening to content, we can see if they're translating it, if they're adjusting the colour. And I think the biggest joy to us is when people don't need to contact us to ask for content in a different format and they're not having to like I did at school put their hand up and say I'm different I need extra support and I think that's the joy um, and so yeah the journey continues. That was fantastic and thank you very much for that. I think everyone can take um, some inspiration and some some actions from what Lynn said there even just I think for me working in marketing is keeping things simple I think that is a, is a key message, um, which I'm definitely going to definitely going to take away. Um, so, yeah, so charities do amazing work to help people and all the resources are normally online. Most times is the first people people explore to find the support they need. And this is where Reset Me comes in uh, and online inclusion, uh, which can play a massive part in supporting a diverse range of people. Um, but I'm going to let Martin tell you more about Reset Me as existence. Ross's story and how we can help people online. Thanks, Michael. Um, so th this was meant to be the bit where Ross tells you his story, um, which obviously has more impact than me telling you it as a third person. Um, but I, I think just listening to, to some of the things that the, the other speakers have talked about there, I, I wanna tell you about the kind of person Ross is and the kind of business Recite is before I tell you Ross's story. And so uh, even just, just now, Lynn, you talked about um, how the pandemic changed things. Mike, you did the same. Um, you specifically, Lynn, talked about non-English content, lots of information coming out from everybody, right? And that almost every 
website I visited at the start of the pandemic had spun up a COVID-19 page with information. Um, and so when we all got sent home on, was it the 17th of March, 17th or 19th of March of 2019, um, Ross did two things. He told every member of staff that nobody would lose their job as a result of the pandemic. And obviously we stuck to that promise. Um, and he also then gave us a mission basically as a sales team, because who wants to hear from salespeople when you've all just been sent home in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and that mission was to get the word out there that anybody with a COVID-19 information page could give us that domain and we would get Recite Me onto it for free. Um, and I haven't got the exact numbers in front of me, but Michael will be able to tell you just how many pages that resulted in. So you, you obviously didn't have to be a Recite Me customer. We would just provide COVID-19 information for free with Recite Me applied so that you could do the translation, you could make the adjustments that you need. Um, so that sort of thing is the reason why people like me stay for six years. Um, but I'll now I'll do the bit I'm supposed to be doing, which is, uh, which is Ross's story. Um, so the reason Ross uh, Recite Me exists is that um, Ross is dyslexic. Um, and like so many people who are dyslexic, his diagnosis was really late. He'd actually finished his university degree by the time he was diagnosed. Um, he was still involved at the uni as president of the student union and was in a room writing some stuff on a on a whiteboard and at the end of the meeting um, one of the people who were in that meeting asked him if he'd ever been tested for dyslexia because their parent was an assessor um, and they could spot dyslexic traits on what he'd done on that whiteboard um, so he went and was tested obviously found out he was dyslexic and his experience then was to um, get access to some assistive tech and that was a software package that he loaded onto his computer which helped um, it enabled him to consume some content more easily but very quickly became a source of frustration because it was on one device and so what does he do when he's in the library or he's in a different office or he's on a laptop or a, um, as <clears throat> in later years of you know, a mobile device or a tablet. Um, and so Ross at that point started to think about how in other walks of, um, in other walks of life is the wrong way to put it, in, in other, um, other parts of the Equalities Act, the onus for the, the reasonable adjustment is with the organization. But yet here we are telling people who are neurodiverse that they have to provide the assistive tech. So the idea for Recite was born to actually have the reasonable adjustments provided by the organization with the content that they're trying to push out to the world. And so that idea formulated and took another five, six, seven, eight years um, to, uh, to be born into a product. Um, part of that is technology, um, it wasn't ready. Um, and the other part was Ross didn't have the money. So in the meantime, he um, he started another business, a software development business, still exists if you want a website or some software dev, I'll put you in touch. Um, and Recite was born out of that business. Um, and so the other panelists have touched on what Recite Me does. So I'm just gonna distill it to a really short sentence. And Recite Me exists to allow your visitors to consume content in ways that work for them and that might be because they're neurodivergent. It might be because of a vision issue. It might be because of a language barrier. Um, but the point is everyone's an individual. So I can talk about those groups, but you know, any one person could exist in all three. And any one person's needs is different to the person next to them. So Ross would prefer to listen to content. If he can't listen to it, he wants it with a yellow background and black text. Chris on our sales team's dyslexic. He would prefer a green background. I saw someone in the chat mention Erlen syndrome. I spoke to someone just the other week who, whose daughter has Erlen syndrome and their preference is a, a really, really bright green with a, a, a black text. And we've already heard from Lynn about how really bright green definitely wouldn't work for someone with 
a, a certain vision impairments. So Recite is all about just giving you as many options as you could possibly have, or as we can possibly deliver. There's, there's undoubtedly more we can do, and we're working in the background to do that. Um, but yeah, that, that, that's, that's what Recite does. And hopefully it, it comes across, as I hope, how, how passionate um, I am and, and, and the team are about what we do and why we do it. Um, but it's really cool for us to be where we are now compared to where we were in 2016, you know, tiny company, not many customers. And the conversation has shifted, certainly in the last three years, probably in the two prior to that as well. Um, and we now work with some of the most recognized brands, um, not just in the UK, but we've now got a team in the US. We've got a team in Australia as well. Um, and so, you know, you'll see Recite Me on the Boots website. Um, that's a Walgreens subsidiary for our American friends. Um, we've got the very group, obviously, with Sean here. We've got organizations like British Gas and Volkswagen and Save the Children and Salvation Army. And I could go on and on and on. Um, but what we see is the stats, as Lynn talked about. And so it blows my mind to know that where we are now is that in the last 12 months, users of Recite Me have viewed 24 million web pages using our software. Um, so it just shows that, you know, although we all know it because we're talking about it, um, there are an awful lot of people out there who need these assisted tools to help them consume your content. Um, I'm going to pass you back to Mike. Uh, sorry, Michael. Um, I think he's got one more poll for you. Yes, I do. Thank you, Martin. And I'd, um, I concur and agree with you about the uh, the passion and working in this space and doing the right thing, tech to good. Um, it doesn't feel like a, a day at work when you're helping people. It's, it's fantastic to do it. Um, so staying with the assistive technology theme, I've got one last question to get everyone involved. Um, oh, I've waved that call. There we go. Uh, out of the people who need assistive technology, what is the percentage of the people who actually have access to it? Um, we have 1%, 5%, 10%, or 20%. Cast your votes. Give it one or two more seconds. There we go. Fastest finger first. We'll see what we've got as an answer. So 1%, 38%. There's going to be lots of percentages here. 5%, uh, 46%, 10%, 13%, 20%, 3%. So 13%, 30 my lucky number. Um, is correct, 10%. So yeah, bit of, a, bit, of a, bit of a shock that. So the people who need assistive technology, as well, not just Recite Me, but other assistive technologies in general to help them um, do their everyday tasks online um, is only 10%, um, which, which is hard to believe and hard to imagine that we're in a world where millions of people, billions of people, only 10% of them are actually able to view content or work with online um, sort of tools um, effectively. Um, you know, we take for granted swiping with our phones and touching our buttons and things on our phones to be able to do things, but other people um, find that difficult or don't have that, the access to it. Um, so before we, we break out into questions, um, we want to make sure everyone's taking away something on the, from this webinar. So we're going to go around the panellists and ask them to be able to provide lasting thoughts or a takeaway that you can take away and hopefully implement or have something to think about uh, beyond this webinar and discussion. Um, should we go, should we do reverse order? Should we go, um, Major, who wants to go first anyways? I was about to, but- I I'll go wait. on, Martin, you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I, I get the feeling I might steal some of Lynn's thunder. This is another reason why I wanted to go first. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I suppose for me personally, um, I see the shift over the last five years, six years that I've been at Recite about how accessibility is is moving towards the top of the agenda. Um, but yeah, making digital accessibility in particular a priority is something I'd like to see. And there, there are some 
some quick tips that 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 I would I would talk about, and Lynn's touched on some of these already. Um, things like um, just make sure that your website has sufficiently high contrast. Um, you know, one in four as, as a minimum is probably the way to, the way to go. Um, and then Mike touched on this one: use buttons and descriptive labels for links. So make sure that your button isn't just a color, as, as Mike said, but it has a description, but also has a descriptive label. And the same with the link. So what I mean by that is um, we all get them. We get them every day, right? We'll all get emails that say, click here, or you'll read an article that says, click here. Click here is useless for someone with assistive tech because it doesn't tell you where they're going. Um, so just make the description descriptive. Um, on a similar note, make sure your images have alternative text descriptions so that anybody, whether they're using Recite Me or their own assistive tech, can hear a description of that image. Um, and I'm, I mean, that's just scratching the surface of it. Um, there's all sorts of stuff like bugbears of mine. You don't see them very often anymore, but don't have auto playing videos on your website. Just, just don't do it. Um, for anybody with a sensory issue, that's probably the worst thing they can find. Um, and similar scrolling images, which can be fine, just not too quick. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm going off on tangents now, but um, think about the usability. Um, and I'm bound to say this bit, right? Because this is where Recite fits. So how do you make your website more usable or as usable as it possibly can be? Um, and some of those things are really easy to achieve. Um, I'll leave it there because I'll, I'll end up going into a recite demo if I don't stop. I'm going next. Um, I think just seeing the stats of how many people would benefit from assistive technology and how many people don't have access to it has really been a joke this afternoon. And I would say that is more reason than ever. My takeaway was just that I think it is a journey. Um, it's a very bold statement for any organisation to say that they are fully accessible. And yet you see a lot of organisations saying it. And I wonder if you kind of drilled into that a bit, what they think that means and if that statement holds true. So don't put the pressure on yourself to say we're fully accessible and we're doing it in the next month. It's a journey. Take small steps, look at the different bits of content you're producing, look at the different work you're doing and work out how that can become accessible, whether that's disability accessibility, access to spaces and digital accessibility. So, yeah, look at the number of people who need it look at the number of people who don't have access to it and just realize that the journey we're on, however small the steps you're taking today are, it's such an important one. Is it me, Mike, or do you want to go? <laughs> Over to you, Sean. So we're going backwards, cool. Um, I, I think the main one for me is, is just ask questions and just take a step back, especially from a recruitment angle, look at your working practices at the moment. And there's always some small quick wins and not everything has to cost you money. The, the great thing when you, you're looking into improving um, just any part of your, your candidate or customer journey is there's lots of great charities out there, networks, communities, people that will help you and share their experiences. So, you know, reach out to, to other people and learn from them. Um, so you can make so many simple changes. One we did was just asking people if they needed reasonable adjustments again physical and non-physical, you can start to build up a bit of a picture if you think about neurodiversity of examples um, that you can actually share, you know, with, with candidates up front. So if they're struggling to, to interpret or, or come back to you on that, you can actually share things you can do um, as well. So, um, and even again, your processes, you know, if someone's presenting, is it important to present them? Can you do sort of offer to do it more of an interactive thing um, on the day or people that want to prepare and you can you get the same result out of the candidate but you en enable them to to choose the option that that works best for them to to bring their best self to that that process as well um because let's be honest when when we're in roles half of the stuff people try and assess for at interviews isn't stuff that you ever need to know or you can get training and development in uh, when you're there. I'm terrible at creating a PowerPoint, for example. Um, so, you know, people can teach me uh, how to uh, tidy those things up. So yeah, basically step it back and, and you'll, you'll open yourself up to a, a, a broader uh, talent pool um, and broader demographic of candidates and, and given the, uh, 
Office for National Statistics uh, recently announcing there's more jobs than uh, unemployed people. Um, it's rather foolish to start trying to uh, cut cut people out of your uh, uh, your potential um, uh, talent pools or, or future employees by by just not asking questions and and, and learning and, and going on that journey. As Lynn said, go on that journey. It's it's never ending, but we're on it together, right? Yeah, and no, uh, I think for me, just to be absolutely clear, that understanding that disability is both a commercial and social opportunity. And actually by putting your commercial hat on, you automatically should be driving the quality of experience. So in some ways your commercial hat drives a better experience for your disabled consumers. And the one bit of advice I would give or tip is go home this evening, um, get your home website up and then unplug your mouse and do what I call the no mouse test. And, and, and just very quickly see how far you can navigate through your website without a mouse. And that will give you a very, very top line barometer of how accessible um, your website or your digital asset might be. And I made the foolish mistake of doing a conference about three years ago, and it was the first thing I said. And of course, what happened is everyone got out their bag, got out their laptops and did it there and then. And quite frankly, I could have said anything I like for the next 45 minutes because no one listened to me. Um, but it's really a good way of understanding the issue that the panelists and Martin and Michael have discussed. And, and I would say to you, in this economic climate, can any business afford to rule out, write off 22% of the population as potential customers? And I would suggest the answer is no. So actually the answers are really straightforward. You just need to get on and do it. Thank you everyone, very much appreciated. Um, I'm conscious of time. I've just looked up the time and Nelly had a heart attack there when I, I thought it was maybe 45 minutes long. Um, do the panellists, uh, should, we, should we ask some questions or would you like them to be all put into a document and sent out to everyone? Should we, should we do some questions or have we wasted, have we spent too much time? I think if you've got a couple, ask got them. A couple. Yeah, well, there's a, there's, there is a few, there is a few here. Um, everyone loved, everyone's loving your idea, Mike, um, of the no mouth test. Um, I'll have to do it myself also. Um, okay, let's have a little look. Bear with me. I do apologise. Um, one for Martin. Uh, does it work on learning management systems hosted on a website? Well, no, we need to be quick, so I'll say yes. There's a longer answer, but yes, Recite works on LMS. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, how would you suggest to create a culture of inclusion for neurodiversity within teams? I think there's two things from me. I think there's a, an, an education uh, piece, first and foremost. And I think with all these subjects, we can go on for hours or days. Um, we, we've recently launched a new manager capability program, um, which is basically trying to help our managers build inclusive team environments, uh, developing a deeper understanding of, of how to work as inspirational equals uh, with their team members, so stuff like uh, valuing different skills, knowledge, behaviours, uh, creating an environment in which diversity of thought is embraced and, and celebrated. And I think once you can create that environment and, and almost that learning culture, I think is most important, you, you can sort of teach and, and guide and bring in a lot of that stuff sorry time but yeah <laughs> no, just, michael I, just one just one thing from me just on that just to save you reading your mba books we absolutely know that the best organizations out there in the world are ones that reflect in their workforce their consumer base so if you become more digital accessible and you drive your consumer numbers, that will drive you to increase your workforce of disabled people because you want to reflect that. Um, and, and that is about just hidden disabilities and people in your organisation who don't disclose. And I will tell you, you start doing things around your customers 
your staff will see that and suddenly you'll have all these people with hidden disabilities you never know disclosed because they want to work for an organization and culture that is about uh, diversity inclusion and disability and, and and if i can just follow up on that i mean it it's not easy um and disclosure is problematic um i, I want to give you an example that uh, you, you know what we do you know what we stand for you know that ross is dyslexic and that's why the business was started that our website up until very very recently the first thing you got to was a video of ross talking about his dyslexia it's the reason we exist i still had people join my team who didn't disclose they were dyslexic until after they'd been offered the job and that's purely based on the experiences they've had previously where disclosing even something like dyslexia has prevented them from being successful in that application so it has to come from the top but as mike says you've, you've got to it has to be seen that you're inclusive um but you've still got some challenges to face for sure because people have their own lived experiences thank you everyone i've got loads of questions i can see them ping through and also i can uh, see all the thank yous and everything and everyone enjoying the webinar so that's fantastic to hear um what we'll do has been a brilliant turnout to see everyone join us and some fantastic points and advice being shared by all. Uh, we've had some questions. We've had also had some requests for sharing the figures we discussed earlier. So we'll make sure that we bag these up into a nice sort of document email with some contact information for everyone, a takeaway points as well. And hopefully within that document, there'll be some stepping stones there that you can take into the real life uh, working environment to help your journey uh, towards more digital accessible platforms. Um, thank you everyone, uh, it's been much appreciated and everyone have a great day and take care.